play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Live from Little Rock, it's Shane Plays Radio, Geek Talk Radio, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for listening, whether you're listening live over the air on 96.5 FM, The Answer, in the Little Rock slash Central Arkansas area, or if you're listening live via 96.5 FM, The Answer.com on the live stream there. Glad to have you. If you're listening delayed by podcast or on... Uh, uh, Crypto Radio. I blanked for a second there, Zach. Crypto Radio. Uh, either of those ways, I'm so happy to have you that way as well. The show is live radio, first and foremost, but we do go out as a podcast um, as well because I love both mediums. And also, we do replay on Krypton Radio. CryptonRadio.com is sci fi for your Wi Fi. And we play a week delayed on Saturdays and Mondays. There, go to CryptonRadio.com and check out the schedule, not only for my show, but all the other great uh, programming that that uh, geek internet radio station has. It's really good stuff. So uh, don't forget, uh, this is live talk radio. So if somebody would like to call in and talk to my guest today or me, uh, we're going to be talking about the Axonar settlement. I, I'll introduce my guest here in a moment after I do the show notes, but uh, we're going to be talking about Axonar. Star Trek Axanar fan film, the the settlement that just happened, what it may mean for not only the future of Axanar, but fan films in general. So really excited. Uh, looked like we were going to get into some long, drawn-out trial, and and they settled. So that's good, and we'll talk about that more momentarily. But this is live radio. You can call in at 501-823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. Or you can tweet me at Shane Plays, S H A N E P L A Y S. That's S H A N E P L A Y S, ShanePlays.com. And speaking of Shane Plays, ShanePlays.com, well, not ShanePlays.com, just Shane Plays on Twitter, but ShanePlays.com, you can always go there for the show notes for today's show and all previous shows. So if you want the news items, or if you want to know more about Jonathan Lane, my guest, or Axonar, or the settlement details, or Fan Film fact- Factor, my um, guest blog, Go to the show notes, shameplays.com. It's up there right now uh, so that you can, if you miss something or want to know more, there you go. And I do archive all the shows, the podcast versions on the blog. Um, the the one that's archived right now is the um, last live show we had. Now, last show ended up being uh, a replay because I was out of town, but uh, uh, Dave Ellswick and I counted down our, our top five geek movies for 2017. That was a lot of fun. You can go to the blog right now or the podcast or whatever and listen to that. And the, the podcast does go out on the blog at shameplays.com, on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many other fine, fine directories, podcast directories. So um, I think that's the housekeeping notes. So we're going to move right along. I'm going to introduce my guest who has been on the show before along with his uh, – his partner in crime, David Hagney, I believe was the name. David Hagney Jr. from Project Small Access, uh, which was related to uh, Star Trek Discovery and Axanar and all that and, and, and CBS's draconian uh, stuff they were doing. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. How are you, buddy? Hey, great to great to be here. Um, just just so you know, I've, I've gotten one of those California colds that happens when it rains out here. Yeah. And so I've got my, my finger close to the mute button, but if yeah. I don't reach it fast enough and I cough in your ear, I'm very, very sorry. Well, no problem. You know, it gave you that one one good thing about congestion and a cold, it gives you like a deep radio voice. So you got you oh. got a little you got a little bit more a little bit more uh in your voice right now. So Coming to you live from Southern California. <laughs> yes. <Jonathan Lane. laughs> exactly. Yeah. Dateline, California, Jonathan Lane. Um <laughs> but anyway, yeah, uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, as as and we'll talk more about this after the news segment, but you know, you're uh, you run Fan Film Factor, which covers all of the Star Trek fan films out there. And there's a lot, not just Star Trek Continues, not just Axanar. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, and then also you've been involved with Project Small Access, uh, which we'll talk. Because I'm curious now with the settlement, I'm curious when we get into this later in the show, what you feel the future of Project Small Access is, if it's changed at all. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> and Project Small Access for the... Cliff Notes was not a boycott. It was saying we still want to support 
CBS with Star Trek Discovery, but we're going to limit the amount of uh, CBS All Access accounts that we subscribe to for that. Uh, we're going to watch it in, in, in groups, and therefore, right. you know, six people subscribe as one, they get less, and that's our way of protesting the guidelines. Right. While the still, we wanted them to right. review, revisit, and revise the guidelines. Right. And so I've heard people reco- refer to it as a boycott. It is not. It's not uh, a boycott, man. It's not a boycott. Um, Okay, so, but we will talk about that more later in the show after the news segment. And we're going to be talking today, a surprise to many, including, I think, both myself and you, based on some of our email exchanges. I think the settlement was a bit of a surprise. Uh, at least it was for me. I you remember we were. Knocked me over with a feather. Could have knocked me over with a feather. So uh, you could have you knocked me over with a phaser on stun. There we go. I'll make a cheesy Star Trek joke. So, uh, And if anybody's listening from, I know we posted this to Project Small Access on Facebook. If anybody's listening, hello, Project Small Access folks. So feel free to call in at 501-823-0965 if you dare. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick news segment. And after that, we're going to talk nothing but Axonar and the lawsuit settlement and all that stuff. So, um, Zach, go ahead and turn on the secret microphone in the newsroom. And there they go. Work it hard. Working hard on a Saturday. Love those guys. Folks, remember, for every dollar of support the Patreon account gets for Shane Plays Geek Talk Radio, the news team gets a dollar an hour raise. And I really do appreciate the Patreon support. I think I mentioned this before, but we've raised probably about close to $600 um, to for, for the show you know, to help offset. Because this it ain't cheap to do a radio show. So, um, and I do have sponsors and I appreciate them very much, but they don't cover all the costs. So I definitely appreciate the Patreon support. Okay. So here's the news items. Jonathan, feel free to chime in or not as you choose. Oh, I got to ask real quick, Zach, I told you I was going to ask you this today. I got to ask my producer, Zach, something real quick, Jonathan. All right. Your team is the Patriots. Mm -hmm. They're going to the, they're going to the the superb owl, right? They're going to the Super Bowl this year, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And you said, what was up with Tom Brady's warming coat thing a couple of, what was that thing? Did warming you, coat. Did you not see that big, huge coat that he had on? He usually wears a lot of them. What? No, this <laughs> thing was like eight feet wide. It was all over Twitter. Go look it up. Okay. Maybe, I want maybe you, it was just overinflated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. It, here we go. Yeah, they called it inflate gate. They really did. <laughs> go look it up. Go look up. Tom Brady's warming coat on Twitter. I want you to do that or on fa- on Google or whatever, and you'll see that he wore this crazy big coat. Did you? Are you into? I'm not really into football, but I couldn't help seeing this on social media. Do you know what I'm talking about, Jonathan? No, I didn't see that, but I, I understand that I'm a long suffering Jets fan. So oh, yeah? anything having to do with Tom Brady, I just sort of ignore anyway. Okay. Uh, oh man, this isn't really a sports show, but but Zach unbeknownst to many is a uh, burgeoning sports analyst so i like to i like to bring him in to talk you see what oh, i'm talking i right. hold on i see the look on zach's face yeah you, you okay. see what what is that i guess it was very cold outside but what is, have you ever seen a coat like that before nope it's like eight feet wide and square wow yeah it's really weird it looks like something out of star trek to be quite honest wow so, yeah anyway all right i want to spend a lot of time on that i want to get through the news thing and then uh and then so we could talk about Axonar, but but uh, just so you know, uh, I want to be very clear that our guest Jonathan Lane is a Jets fan, and 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 Tom and Tom Brady evidently can go hang for all he cares. I don't feel sorry for Jonathan as well. I don't. Oh man, I don't feel no. sorry. <laughs> Who's even it's, look, it's, man? Uh, I don't even know. Living in Los Angeles, you know, we we got the Rams. Thank you very much. Um, but at least we're getting the Chargers. I've been a Charger fan. All right, I. I have to say, go ahead. Zach has to say one something. question. How did you become a Jets fan, but you live in Los Angeles? How? I grew up in New York City. Lived there until 1993. Well, there you go. All questions have answers, Zach. I'll boldly go, and you will find the answers. Okay, here we go. We got to get to the news because I do want to save time for Axonar. All right, this should be no shocker to anybody, but if by some chance you haven't heard this, Star Wars Episode Eight is officially the Last Jedi. That's don't tell me you didn't know that, Zach. Come on, you're in there acting silly. The Last Jedi is the name. Okay, I gotta I gotta go somewhere with the, with this. I gotta do two or three things. One, I gotta go on record. I'm calling it now. Luke Skywalker is not the last Jedi. Ray is. Luke Skywalker is gonna get killed. And Ray's gonna be the last Jedi. That's how I'm calling it. I agree with you. All right. Jonathan, do you have a, an opinion yet? Well, I just I, I think 
think that, you know, if it was more about Luke Skywalker than calling the movie The Next to Last Jedi, you know, mm-hmm. it would probably not fit on movie marquees. Right. Well, uh, but, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, it is what it is. For me, it actually sort of insults the, the end of Return of the Jedi because, you know, there was Return of the Jedi and like, well, now there's The Last Jedi. Yeah, The Last so Jedi. Why were we really waiting for him yeah. to return in the first place? Well, which leads me to another point that I pondered. Um, you're now, because up till now, you're messing with years of of unwritten rules of Star Wars. Up till now, anytime you said Jedi, you were referring to which Star Wars movie? Return of the Jedi. So yeah. if you're making your list of Star Wars movies and you just wrote Jedi, everybody knew exactly what you're, or like Empire or Hope. People know what you're talking about, or Clones, or Menace. Now, there's going to be complete confusion and chaos. Dogs and cats no, will just, live... You'll just say Last Jedi. It's one, it's one more syllable. It's four, four extra letters. Either. Yeah, but we're talking about geekdom here. So there will be there will be repercussions. I'm just saying. I'm being facetious, but I'm being a little true too. I'm serious. People are like, "Well, I love Jedi," and somebody's going to push their glasses up their nose and go, "Um, actually, did you mean Return of the Jedi or the Last Jedi?" Watch, it's going to happen. I'm telling you, here to here to here, folks. I'm being mostly facetious, but anyway, I think it's interesting that Jedi feature, features prominently in two different. Star Wars movies now. And finally, nobody's really talking a lot about the fact that the font is in red. All before, it's always been yellow. Now it's red. So what does that imply? Well, it could be the last red eye. Oh, <laughs> no, no. What, the last flight out of Los Angeles to New York? There uh, you go. Yeah, that was pretty good. I got to give you points for that on quickness. All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you, so, so anyway, I just I'm I'm curious. I'm I, they don't none of this stuff is done like offhand. The fact that that font is red is significant. I think that it's going to follow like the, because it's trying to hit some of the same notes as the original trilogy. And in Empire Strikes Back, the Empire had its day, and I think that the First Order is going to have its day in in the Last Jedi. So well, I'm I'm going to give you an interesting. Um, Thing here, and this is just because I was a trained designer, a graphic designer. Yeah. Um, for colorblind people, a red like that against black is actually very difficult to see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you, you, you don't want to do that. Yellow, you can easily see if you're colorblind. Um, but if you're red, green, colorblind, that yellow, that that red is going to be almost imperceptible to many, many colorblind people. So, my dad. So, while so tr- in, in my in my opinion, a little bit of a mistake potentially. Um, right. That you're gonna have a whole bunch of colorblind people not knowing exactly what the Star Wars movie is because they can't read that the title is The Last Jedi. That's interesting. Well, The Last Jedi fortunately is in white, but the actual logo oh, is in so red. They're not gonna know it's a Star Wars movie, they're just gonna know it's the last Yeah, Jedi. oh there's Last Jedi. Okay. Strange. <laughs> so and I didn't make this a news item, but Rogue One has made a billion dollars now. A billion. So Which is exactly one billion dollars more than I have made. Yeah, no, you know, I think that I think I can. That's another commonality we have there, pal. Okay, uh, Logan, the movie Logan, which I'm actually looking forward to, uh, is in a different universe than the other X Men movies. Hugh Jackman says, and that's an article from GameSpot. So they're starting to get pretty loose with the continuity of the X Men movies because they've man, had. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it, man. Don't don't get another universe. Yeah, don't he said it. it's a. He said, "Let me give you his exact quote." What happened is is the Narada goes enters Logan's universe and the, and they create the Kelvin timeline in the X-Men universe. That's what's happening here. Um, Jonathan. So okay. it's got ripples in all kinds of fandoms. Yep. And Spock's going to show up with green or red jelly or what? I, I don't know. But anyway, all right, here we go. Uh, says Hugh Jackman, who plays Wolverine in the upcoming X-Men movie has revealed that Logan exists in a slightly different universe than the main series. It's not exactly clear how this is all going to shake out, but Jackman says all will be revealed soon enough. When you see the full movie, you'll understand. And this is loosely based on Old Man Logan from the comic books, and Old Man Logan was in a different timeline. Or Love those comics. Yeah, so anyway. Back in my universe, yeah. this is, we, we walked to school uphill both, both ways. ways. In the snow. Back in my universe, in Wolverine. Loved it. Back in my universe, Wolverine still healed rapidly. Back in my universe... <laughs> Anyway, okay, moving on. Uh, and we've got a couple of game-related news items here. Pillars of Eternity 2 from Obsidian Games. Pillars of Eternity, uh, the original, was a very successful uh, Kickstarter campaign for Obsidian. Kind of saved the company and uh, kind of brought back that Baldur's Gate 
style gameplay, which people are loving. Now they got Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire. It's crowdfunding on Fig, which Fig is like Kickstarter, but you can also invest in the game, not just pledge to the game. And it's already met its goal in less than 24 hours, and everything else is just gravy. And then also, uh, earlier this week, uh, they released uh, Road to Eternity, which was the Pillars of Eternity documentary, the making of the game and what it meant to the company and all that, for free on YouTube. I really recommend people go watch this because it uh, not only does it kind of give you a better idea of, of how it's it's enjoyable in a creative endeavor, but it's also really hard to make video games. And also, Pillars of Eternity saved the company. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to uh, to watch the documentary. It's free on YouTube. All these news items are linked on the show notes at shameplays.com. So uh, anyway, that that's the news. Uh, I wanted to get through that quickly so we could talk plenty of Axonar. I want to, um, before we're, we got a break coming up, but before we get to break, Jonathan, I, I want to catch us up briefly on, on what has happened and not the details, but the very broad strokes on what has happened the last couple of weeks in the Axonar legal world. Well, I'm going to have to finish this up after your break because sure. there's just there's just a little too much to go through. But okay, just so you know, at the beginning of January, the judge made what is known as a summary judgment, and both sides can request this, which is basically saying these are things that are beyond question. We don't even need to bring them in front of the jury because they're just so obvious. And one of his summary judgments that he made was that the fair use defense, which is the entire basis of what Alec Peters and Axnar were going to use to defend this lawsuit, uh, was invalid. Yeah, which, which that, that did not sound future. good for Axnar. Well, to give you an idea of what fair use is, and you know, just give me a countdown of like a minute warning before you have to go to break. All right. uh, but fair use is basically the middle ground between the First Amendment, which says we have freedom of speech in this country, and copyright laws, which says you don't have freedom of speech. You, you, you can't take somebody else's work. And the thing about fair use is for 200 years, fair use was decided by juries on a case-by-case basis. You know, is this, is this allowable? Are, are you, you know, you're copying, yes, but is it an allowable form of copying? And I'll give you a really good example. There was a book called Gun Gone the Wind, which was a book that basically retold the story of Gone with the Wind from the point of view of the slaves. Okay. Same characters, same descriptions, same events. For all intents and purposes, stealing the original book. Right. Just from a it different was ruled perspective. Fair use. It was and ruled fair use? It w- was ruled fair use. Wow. They were able to, to talk about the fact that it was transformative enough from the original. And it made a social commentary about the way the black people were treated back when they were slaves in the nineteen in the eighteen sixties, and it was allowed. And this this book went on to sell you know many hundreds of thousands of, of copies in the bookstores. Um, so fair use is the sort of fickle mistress because you never know when a jury is going to say fair use is in effect or fair use is not in effect. So Axmar had a fairly good chance of getting a fair use jury. No pun intended. If they were able to convince the jury that, you know, it was transformative because Axanar, Prelude to Axanar was a mockumentary. You know, Star Trek has never been produced in a documentary format before. And, you know, yeah, they used a couple of characters, but not a lot. You know, most of them were original. They, they had all these arguments already. And the judge cut them off of the knees. Right. And tell me how much time I have to your break and I can... Uh, you, got, you got about another minute. Another minute? Okay. Yeah. So when the judge took away fair use, and this was January 5th or thereabouts, it basically was a wake-up call for both sides. Because for Axanar, they suddenly only had one very slim path to victory, which was to prove that Prelude to Axanar was not substantially similar to Star Trek, and good luck with that. Um, and even though they had potentially a non-willful infringement, which I'll get into in just a second after the break, um, for the most part, their path to victory was now incredibly, incredibly narrow. The wake-up call for the studios was that for 200 years, fair use had been decided by juries. 
And now the judge was coming and saying, I'm deciding fair use. I'm not giving this to a jury. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, and I guess we'll maybe have to get to this later, but how? Wh- where did that come from? It's a good question. After the break, I'll give you a, a short history lesson on, on law for the last 200 years. Um, yeah, I learned a brief history later. of time. All right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead, and that's a good spot to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're not going to spend the whole show talking about the super legal stuff, but I do want to get... <laughs> I do want to get sort of a, a quick download from uh, on Jonathan, because in order to understand what's going on with Axnar and fan films, you have to understand a little bit of the legal context. And again, we're talking about Star Trek fan films, that there's been a ton of them, and CBS and Paramount decided to single out one fan film, which was Axnar, and went after it in a very rabid manner, uh, lawsuits, this, that, and the other, um, and, and then, you know, where we're at. So they were about to go to trial, and then suddenly they settled. Uh, so that, that's that's kind of what's going on. We'll talk about that more after the break here on Shame Plays Geek Talk Radio. Comic book lovers, visit the wildstars.com today. today. From the mind of author and comic book industry expert Michael Tierney, it's not just a comic book, it's a comic book novel. The Wild Stars is sci-fi and so much more. Learn the explanations behind UFOs and space gods. This isn't the Twilight Zone. This is the region of the Milky Way galaxy known as the Wild Stars. We guarantee you've never read anything like it. The complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell, with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read The Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. The Die is Cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure, where dragons lie, and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game Game store or trolllord.com to get your copy of Castles and Crusades today. Shame Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays. Hey, welcome back to Shane Plays Geek Talk Radio, a journey into the things we love. Uh, this is live talk radio. If you happen to be listening live over the radio or online at 96.5 FM, the answer.com, you can call in at 501-823-0965, or you can tweet me at Shane plays S H A N E P L A Y S. I'm joined by Jonathan Lane, of uh, fan film factor and also project small access. Uh, and we are talking about the Axonar settlement, uh, that that came rather quickly and surprised many people. Uh, CBS and Paramount were suing Axanar, even though there's a lot of other fan films out there. They went after Axanar. And so what happens or happened has a lot of ramifications, not just Axanar, but for fan films in general. And Star Trek with the, I, I would say Star Trek has the most rabid, committed, deeply loyal fan base of any fandom out there. I, I, I don't think any Absolutely. other one. So, this this is a big this is a big deal. Um, so in many times, and and one of the reasons that I'm horked off at CBS and Paramount about this, not that they they may or may not have the ultimate legal right that they think that they had. It, it, we won't know now because it never went to full trial. But the fans have kept Star Trek going at times when CBS and Paramount never did, and and it's always been massively a fan endeavor. And, and and to do what they did, 
you know, legally, technically, maybe is okay, but philosophically, it was incredibly jerky. So that's that's my take on the subject. So anyway, having said all that, the judge unilaterally decided, which judges can unilaterally decide things, but uh, in a very unexpected move, he decided on his own that fair use was not a valid defense here instead of letting the Correct. jury... Let, let, me, let me give yeah. you 200 years of history in 30 seconds. Okay, go for it. Okay. 17, 1750s is when fair use was first brought up as a defense. And for 200 years, it was a jury decision. And then in the ni- 1968 was the first time a judge ever ruled, ruled on it in summary judgment. And by the 1990s, very short period of time legally, it became something that judges almost always ruled on. And they would say, okay, this is, this is fair, fair use, this is not fair use. And there was never any legal discussion. There was never any new legislation that was, that was done. It was just that the judges decided they did not trust the juries. The juries are just too unpredictable. And so by making this decision, the judge didn't do anything arguably wrong, except potentially violating Alec Peter's Seventh Amendment rights to a jury trial because he cannot give himself a proper defense anymore for a potentially multi-million dollar lawsuit. He, he had the potential of losing $8.55 million in a verdict. So this was now a case that was open to appeal, which is not to say that Alec would have won the appeal, but at least was grounds for appeal, because you can't appeal a verdict just because you don't like the verdict. You have right. to have there have to be grounds for an appeal, right? Yeah, you can't just say, uh, you can't do what, well, I'm not even going to go politically. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it says, well, basically you have to say, look, the judge made a mistake at some point. And this is a potentially reversible mistake for the judge. So potentially now, even if Alec lost this case in March or April of this year, it could be appealed to the Ninth Circuit, which would take another year or two, and then potentially thrown back to a new trial where he would be allowed fair use, and then CBS and Paramount would have to spend another million dollars because they probably spent about a million dollars on, on legal fees so far. Alec has not spent anything except for maybe a few thousand dollars on like you know travel expenses and such. So, um, well, okay, and, so what you're saying, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying and maybe clarify for any listeners who are trying. The fact that the judge ruled on his own that this was not fair use opened up uh, a path for appeal? Yes, it okay. opened up a right. path for appeal, which does not mean that Alec was going to win this ultimately. Right. But he had the possibility now of winning a war of attrition because, you know, who who wants to have to deal with the publicity? Especially in the 50th anniversary year. Especially in the 50th anniversary year of Star Trek. You know? Yeah, which is yeah. going to be the 51st anniversary. But now they're going to be dealing with this lawsuit still being a footnote in every article on Star Trek for the next two to three years. So... The summary judgment ruling pretty much made both sides say, man, we really should think about settling. Yeah. Now, there's some folks out there that believe that a late decision by the judge the Wednesday before the settlement was announced on Friday um, to make Alec Peters' uh, financials public was, you know, a panic button, and they they suddenly managed to to complete a settlement in 24 hours. Uh, No, that's not what happened. Uh, that does not happen, not with two huge corporate entities. Like right, that. yeah. Well, they wouldn't. In fact, in fact, uh, I would say, as a, as a armchair quarterback here, that if if Alec releasing his <clears throat> financials weakened his position, then CBS and Paramount probably wouldn't have been quite so eager to settle. They'd have wanting, they would have wanted that information to come out and let him roast a little bit because that was oh, one absolutely. of the, that was one of the main points is people you know Alec and and all the people looking at his books and everything saying he hadn't made a dime off this uh but you know there was a lot of implications now we'll never know uh i i tend to believe Alec and and his crew but we'll never actually know only yeah, only no, Alec I've seen, yeah I've, I've actually seen i've seen the books of one of those few people who signed right. on disclosure i've seen the book the fact is that there are so many things that are on there yeah that there's just no room for embezzlement there's just too many yeah i mean who have been paid. I, I don't think i don't think at any point in here i really honestly don't think now i've never met alec peters personally i've had him on the show i'm talking with you know, you were involved in some emails where they're probably going to come on the show down the road to talk about the future of Axonar. I've never met the man personally, but at no point 
did, during any of this process did I think he was doing this to make money. I, I felt like he was doing it because he loved Star Trek. Yeah, no, if he, if he wanted yeah. to make money with it, he would have settled a long time ago. Right. He would have said, oh, you know what, the, the studios stopped the production, mm. and, you know, sorry, we tried, and walked away with whatever, you know, new tires and sushi he, he had managed to get. The right. fact that he has pursued this in court with the gusto that he has for the last year is almost proof that he didn't embezzle any money because the easiest way to get away with it would have been to say, okay, it's all the studio's fault and sorry. Right. So, but okay. anyway, I just wanted to, to mention, because I know we, we're running out of time, um, that the, the terms of the settlement almost show that both sides gave a little bit on this. And, and most was, settlements do. Right. And yeah, and that's the yeah. whole idea of the settlement is that both sides give a little and both sides give a little. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I heard Christian Gossett a couple of days ago on, a, on another um, podcast uh, say that, uh, you know, we should be grateful that the studios were feeling generous enough to no, let Alec Peter. No, 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 no. If I got to say, they weren't feeling generous. They weren't as ironclad as they thought. You don't settle if you're sure you're going to win. Yeah. Well, here's yeah. the thing studios are yeah. never generous. Yeah. And they wouldn't have sued Alec Peters for, you know, eight point five million dollars to begin with if they were feeling generous. Right. Um and the thing is is that there are actually some very generous um aspects of the settlement. So, you know, let's let's take a second and look at what Yeah, let's look at the terms of the settlement. Uh, and and I understand I know there's probably there's some legal legal out legal eagles out there that wish we would go more into the legal aspect. We just don't have time. Uh now have Jonathan, time. go to Fan Film Factor Follow up with Project Small Access, whatever. Jonathan is is being quite prolific in writing about this stuff, and he's analyzing it on a very deep level. So go to Fan Film Factor and check all this stuff out. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's look at the terms of the settlement. Yeah, from a 30,000-foot level. And the thing is that there's a lot of details that we don't know because settlements are generally completely confidential, although there's certain things that had to be revealed to the public because... Alec was going to go and make Axonar, and right. people had to know that that was okay. Well, it was crowdfunded. I mean, people paid in. One of the reasons this got so visible, there's a lot of people that put money in because they wanted to see Axonar made. So, yeah, so, so CBS and Paramount, they didn't just sue. Now, technically, they just sued Alec in his studio, but philosophically, they sued every Kickstarter backer. Well, also, the original complaint included a whole bunch of John Doe's, um, you know, which could have included think, people like Gary Graham and Tony Todd and J.G. Hertzler and anybody else who was involved in the thing. So, you know, when Alec, you know, people are saying, why didn't Alec just, you know, cave at the beginning? He could right. have prevented all this. Like, no, he couldn't have. If he had caved at the very beginning, there was still a multi-million dollar lawsuit out there. Right. You know, and Alec actually did say to CBS, look, this, this is my proposed settlement to you. He said that five days after getting sued. He said, here's what I'd like to start our discussions with. And they never responded. Well, because at this point, they wanted to make an example of him. I mean, this right. is this is my analysis. I don't have any, you know, I I don't have any true uh, facts to back that up. No, but, I, I, I knew they wanted to make an example. Yeah, they want to make they, an example of him. They and they, look, they could have called him. Right. You know, it, and he met with them on four different occasions saying, is this okay? And they kept saying, we can't tell you. We can't give you any guidance because if we do, it becomes an officially recognized fan film. So we cannot tell you. I can't do that. But yeah. If you cross the line, we will let you know. The problem was is when he crossed the line, they, they sued him. The lawsuit. Yeah, they did. Nobody reached out and said, "Hey, you might want to." So, so here's the thing. Uh, I want to. One of the reasons that I have talked about Axonar a lot on the show, I think. I, I think this is like the third show that I've dedicated to it. Um, is there are a lot of fan films out there, a lot. And all of a sudden, they went after Axanar with a vengeance. And one, yeah, okay, he raised a lot of money. And B, it looked really, really good. But that's not, if you, if you sue them, you should be suing everybody, right? If well, it's a fair they use thing. They don't have to, but they, they potentially lose. Um, a non will uh, you know exactly a if they down the road if 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 they sue somebody ten years from now, then that person could say, well, you haven't sued these other twenty. Why are you coming after me? And it, and it becomes like that's why Apple goes after anybody that puts I in front of their stuff. Well, hold on because you're you're confusing trademark with copyright. Trademark you do have to vigorously defend. Copyright okay, all right, well. fair enough. Um, but here's the thing: Alec Peters was part of his defense, and the judge actually 
potentially acknowledged that this is a viable defense um, was for willful versus non-willful okay. infringement. So even if Alec was found liable for infringement, willful infringement means you knew exactly what you were doing, and $150,000 per violation is your fine. And he had 57 violations. That's $8.55 million. Non-willful means that you had a reasonable expectation to believe that you were not violating a copyright, which the fact that there was 50 years of Star Trek fan films and the studio had never done anything, that Alec had talked to the studio executives on four different occasions and they never said boo to him. Um, and the fact that there were many fan films that were going even farther than Axanar did in terms of using, you know, Kirk and Spock right. and Coy and, you know, he was using Garth and Silva. Um, that and he was setting it, if people don't know, just in case, Axanar is set before the original series during what's called the Four Years' War, which was introduced in a FASA role-playing game, Star Trek supplement. None of this stuff had ever been explored. I mean, he, was, he, wasn't, ta he wasn't stepping on any toes as far well, as... You know, it, it, yeah. we, we, can, we can go off on hours and hours of whether or not this was or was not Star Trek. But the fact of the matter was that if Alec had managed to win in court with a non-willful infringement, which was basically saying, look, it was infringement, but he had a reasonable expectation to believe that the studios were okay with this. And even the judge said that that was a reasonable defense. He wanted that to go in front of a jury. He didn't make a summary judgment on that. He said that right. the jury could decide that. Right. Well, then the fine per violation goes down, 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 down from $150,000 per violation to 200. Mm. Not 200,000, 200. Mm. 57 what? violations of that, and suddenly Alec Peters, you know, writes a check for $11,000, leaves the courtroom and says, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks for all the uh, publicity for Axanar. <laughs> I mean, I know that's not, I mean, that's well, being no, facetious. Well, no, probably but... have been enjoined from doing it. And, that, and yeah. that's what, you know, so the thing is, the studio could have won even with an $11,000 embarrassing judgment. It cost them a million dollars to make 11000 They still would have made their point. Right. They could have permanently prevented Axanar from being made. And instead, the settlement not only allows Alec Peters to make Axanar, but to use the same actors. Yeah, that's big. You know, because that was Gary one of the things Graham in the guidelines. Snowball, a character he played on Enterprise. Yeah, that was one of the things in in uh, in the guidelines that they issued. The, I call them the draconian guidelines that you couldn't use the same actors and that sort of thing. So, uh, all right. So, uh, okay, I'm going to take you from uh, from. Well, I talk should mention that he does have to follow the rest of the guidelines, meaning that it has to be just two 15 minute. Right. episodes for a half an hour total, as opposed to the 90 to 100 minutes. Right. But that being said, this is huge because he's only giving up 70 minutes of his story, which he can tell in another format. Right, like a, yeah. No, I like think... an audio player or comic book or who knows. I mean, I, I really, they have no idea what they're going to be doing right now. They're all going to be meeting in a couple of weeks, and they're going to say, look, this is what we have. This is an amazing opportunity. How are we going to use it? How are we going to make this work now? Because we really do want to deliver... Well... Right, and and he to the fans. and he also they they get to keep showing for free the twenty minute prelude they've already done. That gets to be shown, and that's for free. huge. And by the way, yeah. they also get to distribute Axanar when they finally make it as a DVD to donors. Yeah, no, which it's is something it's that all other fan films are not allowed to do. So here's these guidelines, and already three of the guidelines are are being suspended for Axanar. Well, which the, is a huge settlement. Well, the ultimate thing to me that's huge is CBS came in, CBS and Paramount, you know. Now, there may be some people at CBS and Paramount that are sympathetic to Axanar. I have no idea. But the official public face of CBS and Axanar, the legal department, went after with a vengeance. And they did not completely shut them down. And that, to me, is major. Uh, that, that, to me, is major, major, major. So, uh, And it also says that at the end of the day, they weren't a hundred percent confident that a jury wouldn't side with that would a jury would side with them. Uh, so it it you know it, it shows weakness in their claim that you know you can't do this or whatever. I mean, I it, my th here's my thing. This is not legal. This is philosophical. The fans love Star Trek, fan films, and I mean fan films for the past ten years or so have kept me much more into Star Trek than any of the official stuff that 
CBS and Paramount's been doing. So, uh, you know, it's it, it philosophically, if you make a fan film and it, and it, and it, and it, and you don't make money with it and there isn't some just incredibly egregious thing, like you don't show Kirk, you know, chopping off people's heads and being a child molester and something like that. I just don't see what the problem with it is, but you know, I understand that's not a legal thing. Like the legal world is different from the real world. So, well, it, you know, I'll tell you something. You know, while I was trying to practice for this phone interview in my car and, and, and come up with, you know, answers to you, I came up with a really long, half hour long answer, which I realized I could never do on your show. <clears throat> but it was basically talking about the trend line, which is that the studios were looking at what had been happening with fan films over the last 10 to 15 years. And they're getting they really good. <laughs> garage projects. Yeah, they're getting good. You know, to getting good, to using, I mean, it was, you know, Alec Peters was not the first fan film. To you know, to actually use a Star Trek cast member reprising right. his role, and he was not the first fan film to pay people because this Star Trek: New Voyages did that in 2006. <clears throat> Pardon me. When they when they paid George Takei to appear as Sulu, right? Um, they paid the writer director Mark Zakri, um to write it, and Mark Zakri himself paid an editor sixty thousand dollars to work on. The World Enough in Time was the, was the, was the title of it. Right, that's the one that had Sulu in it. World right. Enough in Time and Star Trek New Voyages. Google that and watch it. It's that's good stuff. Amazing. They did um, another one with Chekhov that was really good, too. And the well, you know, one yeah. was before that. And I think Walter was probably paid for that one as well. Yeah. And then, you know, the year a year after that, Sky Conway made Star Trek of Gods and Men, which had like a dozen different Star Trek actors in it, including Michelle Nichols playing Gahara right. and yep. Koenig again and again yep. and, and yep. Tim yep. playing Tuvok. Um, and then Kickstarter changed everything, and suddenly they were able to raise 5000 10000 100000 even more. Um, Star Trek Renegades had a Los Angeles red carpet premiere at the Crest Theater in Westwood. I was there. <laughs> the marquee said Star Trek Renegades. They had paparazzi, and not like one or two paparazzi. They had like a dozen Yeah, it was, like a, it was like a premiere. <laughs> it was a premiere. <laughs> All right. Of a hey, Star I have Trek to... Star fan film that they made for three hundred and fifty thousand yeah, yeah, dollars well, let me say, I got to stop you. I got to get another break in when we come back. Okay. We'll we'll talk about some of that. But yeah, I mean, I think that, I think the reason that they went after, well, you know what, actually, I'm starting to wonder if if they already had plans for Discovery and then Axonar came along in that same, you know, timeline and that's what really triggered it. But I'm also wondering with the rushed timeline of discovery, did they suddenly throw to something together in the four years war timeline to give themselves more of a case against Axonara? I don't know if we'll no, ever. No, no, I, I, I haven't. That's not the case, but I don't want to go into the details, but no, that was not. That was not okay. Happened. So, so Axonar not only looked amazing and raised a lot of money, but happened to be in, in a timeline for a show that they were planning on doing. Well, yeah, here, here's the thing. Brian Singer had always been planning for um, his his show. Fuller? You mean Brian, Brian Fuller? Brian Fuller, not Brian yeah. Singer. That's a different Brian. Yeah. Brian Fuller had always been planning for the series to be set beforehand. Now, I don't know. I mean, he, he, he didn't see Axnar and say, oh, that's a great you know setting for it. It's just, it just so happened to, you know, coincided but really, what was happening was the fan films weren't going away, and the numbers and the quality were getting, getting better and better and better. Higher. Yeah, and I honestly think that Renegades would have been sued if it weren't for Tim Russ, who was writing and directing it. And well, they didn't. CBS they end up dropping the name own. Star Trek. Like they're talking about keeping it going, but dropping the name Star Trek from Renegades. I think. I, I, it yeah, seems Renegades like I heard actually. That. They're coming out with with, with Renegades, um, the Requiem, um, next week. Okay. Cool. Uh, so look for that. Uh, All right. Well, let me stop us there. Okay, I want to get us a break ahead. in and give us enough time to come back to kind of put a bow on things. Uh, okay. So some goblins are your friends. Game Goblins is Central Arkansas's premier retailer of Magic the Gathering, Warhammer 40K, board games, card games, RPGs, miniatures, and hobby accessories. Call Game Goblins at 501-224-GAME or visit them online at GameGoblins.com. For all your gaming needs, I heartily recommend Game Goblins. Make sure to check out all their customer or check out their customer loyalty program that rewards you based on your actual purchases. Game Goblins earns your business and keeps it. First time customers mention Shane plays and receive ten dollars off your purchase of fifty dollars or more. Call Game Goblins at five zero one two two four Game or visit them online at gamegoblins.com. Tell them Shane plays sent you. <laughs> Thank you. 
comic book lovers. Visit thewildstars.com today. From the mind of author and comic book industry expert Michael Tierney, it's not just a comic book, it's a comic book novel. The Wild Stars is sci-fi and so much more. Learn the explanations behind UFOs and space gods. This isn't the Twilight Zone. This is the region of the Milky Way galaxy known as the Wild Stars. We guarantee you've never read anything like it. The complete comic book novel took 20 years to tell, with one reviewer noting, the story of the Wild Stars stretches ambitiously across space and time, from small town murders to the destruction of planets, with every event given multiple layers of meaning. If you haven't read the Wild Stars, you're missing out. Visit thewildstars.com today. The die is cast. Plunge into worlds of fantastic adventure where dragons lie and the undead stalk the shades of your mind's imagines. Where creatures of legend plunder wealth through the horror of their passage. Monsters grim and foul hold the ecstasy of gold and the renown of glory. All this and more awaits you and your friends in the unlimited, fantastic world of the Castles and Crusades role-playing game from Troll Lord Games. Visit your friendly local game store or trolllord.com to get your copy today. A rules-light, adaptable game that has stood the test of time. Twelve years in constant publication with no new additions, Castles and Crusades is the original easy-to-play attribute check system. Join us and unleash your imagination. Visit your friendly local game store or trollord.com to get your copy of castles and crusades today shame plays radio is blessed to have sponsors and we appreciate them very much however did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as one dollar an episode simply go to patreon.com slash shame plays Okay, welcome back. Shane plays Geek Talk Radio. I'm your host Shane Sachs. I'm joined by Jonathan Lane of Fan Film Factor. The, he's 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 the reigning expert and uh, news uh, bringer of Star Trek fan films. And uh, we've been talking about and almost uh, a witness in the Axnar case. Almost a witness in the Axnar <laughs> case. So help you goodness. All right, nope. uh, or so help you God. So um, okay, if. Uh, well, not if we got about five or six minutes here, but I want to kind of wrap things up. And and, and I know there's probably things you definitely absolutely want to mention. So uh, what what's like what's one thing we haven't discussed that you want to make sure people absolutely understand about not only the case that happened, but the like the settlement? What What's what's a major point that you think people need to know? Uh, there's a couple of things. I was actually I, I have an interview uh, with Alec Peters that's coming out next week on Fan Film Factor. Um it would have come out this week, but unfortunately, my computer is dead. And yeah, your Macintosh is not happy. I know it's well; it's five and a half years old, and it got senile. Okay, it was the logic board. Um, but you know, there's there's three different groups here. There's there's the detractors that say, "Oh, the studios won, and Alec lost." Which I don't Pardon. see how you can see it that way. Well, you know, it, 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 you go to a, a Facebook group called CBS uh, slash Paramount versus Axonar, um, and and you'll you know yeah. you'll, you'll see a lot of. Uh, I mean, you can't you right. can't say that Axonar one hundred percent won, but there's right. no way you can say that the, a he loss for Axonar would be the jury ruled against him and Alex owes eight point five something million dollars and he can't make Axonar. Yeah, I mean that you know right. that that would have been a real loss. Well, speaking then, of, of talking about detractors, say, you know, Alex won huge. Let me. See, I I think. Okay. Well, I don't think he won huge, but I think he won. Well, then there's one other group, and this is why, you know, you said, is there anything else I wanted to say? Yeah. This is very important. There's one other group that was the, Alex should have fought. He shouldn't have settled. He could have won this. And, you know, there's one person who actually said, I, I'd rather there be no Axonar at all than, than this travesty. I, I said, saw that on, I saw that on Project Small Access. Somebody said that. And I went, really? I like, yeah, really? Well, it's not their rear and their money on the line. And that's what Alec told me. I was chatting with him on the phone yeah. the other day, and you know, he said, he said, "Look, you know," and, and he said, "You know, I look, I talked brave, and the thing was, I really did think I could win this. But you know what? You get sued by two public yeah. companies, publicly traded movie studios, and you have their lawyers bearing down on you for thirteen months." And tell me if you're not going to turn to jelly at some point. Yeah. No, I think I would have taken the settlement because uh, 
you know, at this point, it looked like the odds not were ironclad in their favor, but it looked like the odds were in favor of his, CBS his and Paramount best legally. Way of winning was going to be a war of attrition. His yeah. best way, yeah, of was to appeal was to and all that. Yeah. You know, look, we don't want to go to appeal. If they lose appeal, we don't want a new trial, which would have probably put him back to this point of okay, we're offering you a settlement because they weren't just going to put, to drop it at that point. So Alec was probably looking at the bet if he could get them to allow him to make Axanar with the actors, using all the money he had raised already, letting him keep the studio. I mean, that's huge. He's built a half-million-dollar studio in this. He gets to keep it. There is apparently no penalty. He's not paying any money. Right. He's getting to make 30 minutes of Axanar right. and use his actors. I mean, yes, he's not allowed to pay them. Right. And how we'll get around that, if he gets around that at all, I have no idea. You know, the actor's still going to want to pay, you know, work for no money. I don't know. Yeah, it depends on their love for the project or whatever. I know yeah, for a I fact. Know some of them are very much looking forward to doing it. I know for a uh, fact I interviewed, yeah, um, oh, I can't, Richard Hatch, and he really was looking forward to doing it. You know, he's like, I'm looking forward to doing the full thing. So, oh, now, yeah, I, I talked yeah. to J.G. Hertzler in Las Vegas, and yeah. he really wants to do it. He, he's, he's like so pissed off at, at, at CBS and Paramount for this. Well, let me say this. I got to say, you know, something that I've noticed, you were talking about detractors. There was this Twitter account called Axonar Monitor that any time I would mention Axonar, they would come out of the woodwork and jump on me. Since this settlement happened, nothing. So I suspected that they were, you know, like a a puppet account, you know, for for the powers that be. And now I'm really convinced of it. So I don't know about puppet account. I, I yeah. think they, I know you're talking about Axonar yeah. Monitor was, was Carlos Pedraza. Um, you know, Carlos is sort of my other half. He he brings the other balance to the force. You know, which one of us is the light side, which one of the dark side, I don't know. But the fact is that he has a certain lean, and I've got a certain lean. I am very much pro Axonar. He is very much anti Alec Peters and anti Axonar. And the two of us present the facts the way we oh, okay. see them. Okay. All right, man, I hate to do it. We got to wrap. Oh, you got to stop me there. Yeah, okay. I hate to do it. Man, good stuff. Uh, we're going to have you on again, Jonathan. We're going to start doing a... Talk about the fate of Project Small Access, because I'm trying to figure that out right now. And yeah, I'm if curious. If I talk to you again, I'll probably have a figure Yeah, out. well, we're going to have you on again. You and I have talked about having a recurring show, maybe two or three times a year, where you just update us on fan films. Because as, as glad as I am that we're going to move forward with Axonar, I want to start talking about fan films in a positive light. You know, and... I'll, I'll let you off with one very, very quick thing. Do you know how many fan films have been released since the guidelines came out last June? I honestly don't know. 47. Have they been following the guidelines? Many of them have. Some of them haven't, but some of them were kind of grandfathered in because they were in production when the guidelines came out, so they were allowed. Well, wasn't Axnar in production when the guidelines came out? Anyway, I'm not well, even going to go down there. Dude, yeah. I'm not going to go down there. All right, don't well, go there, man. Don't thanks, go there, man. Thanks for the update. We're going to have you on again down the road. Uh, and and I've got to do this. Uh, I've got a new tradition called the bad joke of the week. So we've got it. We got to finish on this. And folks, next week we're going to have Ross Watson, RPG game designer, including Savage Riffs on. But here's the bad joke of the week. I'm ready. If you're in a room that's cold, if it's too cold, don't worry. Just go to a corner because it's 90 degrees there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, baby. We'll catch you next time on Shane Plays Geek Talk Radio. Thanks, Jonathan. How did my father die? A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil, helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. He betrayed and murdered your father. Now the Jedi are all but extinct. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual for as little as $1 an episode? Simply go to patreon.com slash Shane